Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Kamal Ahmed. I'm the editorial director of uh, BBC News. Uh, we are an organisation that uh, produces nine hours of content every hour. And at the moment, politicians don't like very much of it at all. So it's quite a sort of difficult position at the moment because of the campaign. But today we're here to talk about the role of the editor. That person who decides on whatever platform or print product or digital product that they're working for or broadcast product, what is the news? Now, my first job was on the Lennox, <coughs> excuse you, Vic, Sorry. The Lennox Herald <laughs> newspaper uh, in Dumbarton outside Glasgow. And my editor there was Bill Heaney. And when I started in journalism in 1992, I think, or one, uh, the editor was the power in the land, whether that land was small in Dumbarton, a very ancient local newspaper, but very much part of the community, or whether that land is huge and you edit a national newspaper. The editor was sort of God, but how much that has changed uh, over the decades as audiences have been able to self-publish, do their own journalism, our relationships with them have changed enormously. In the olden days, we used to sit in a castle and throw the news over the castle walls, and if every now and again we got a letter through the front door, we'd maybe read it and think about it. Now that has completely changed. Here to talk about the role of the editor in the modern media world, we have a spectacular brains trust of people. <laughs> uh, on my far left, not politically, I'm assuming, <laughs> is Chris Evans, the editor of uh, the Telegraph Group, of uh, newspapers and obviously massive digital uh, organization. On his right is Alison Phillips, the editor of the Daily Mirror. Alison and I almost shared an editor <laughs> at university. We did uh, share. Uh, and, or maybe we did. Uh, Alison and I were both um, uh, alumnus of Leeds Student, the finest student newspaper in the UK. Although now at the BBC, of course, other student newspapers are available, <laughs> probably on the one hand, on the other hand, equally good. Um, on her right is Alessandra Galloni, Global Managing Editor of Reuters. Uh, welcome, Alessandra. Vic, with his cough. Vic Monchun, uh, Monchun Editor, Monchun. Head of News of, uh, at The Voice. And uh, on his uh, right, um, uh, uh, Nancy Fielder, Editor of The Sheffield Star. So welcome to the panel. Uh, we'll have a bit of a chat up here uh, first, uh, and then we'll throw to the audience with 20 minutes or so to go, and you can ask all the questions I have failed to ask. But let's uh, start, Chris, uh, with you. Tell us a bit about what you think the role of an editor is. Um, well, I think, I think uh, the role of the editor is to identify and assemble the best possible team of journalists, obviously, to give them the tools to do the job, I suppose, by which I mean more than pencils, but the right environment in which they can flourish. Um, and in particular, to create uh, a culture of ideas, ideas ideas, 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 in which they can improve, hopefully do great work, and I can take the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, how much has that role changed in, in your career in terms of maybe where the power relationship is now? As I suggested at the beginning, what, certainly when I started in my career, and I don't know if it was the same for you, it was very much the editor made the bulk of the decisions about what was done. And I sense now that there is a slightly different relationship that it is about assembling a team and actually much more is maybe driven from the bottom up than maybe it was when we started or maybe that's not quite. Well, I thought, yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, I mean, after all, we are responsible for much more than we were. It, it used to be just a newspaper. Now it's a newspaper, a website or newspapers, a website. And in our case, um, a couple of uh, apps. Um, I mean, I, I'm so far from being an imperial editor that I, I don't even have an office. Um, I, there's a meeting room we use for meetings, but I, I, 
I sit out uh, in the middle and um, try to be collegiate. Um, I can see one or two of my colleagues uh, in the audience who are probably not meeting my eye because they uh, differ uh, <laughs> with, with that assessment, but uh, that's, that's certainly my aim. Alison, what do you think of, uh, when you think for yourself as an editor, what does that, what does that mean to you? Um, I sort of see my role as being the reader's representative in the newsroom. So um, I, I completely take your point that I think the, the power structure in newsrooms has changed um, in, in the way that society more widely has changed. And it's very much now about everyone having that input into the final product. But I think as within any organisation and you've got a news editor that's saying this, should, this is a great story, you should be focusing all efforts on this, or you've got a feature editor that's saying this, or my role is to sort of take a step back from that and think... What would the reader be most interested in at this point? What does the reader want to know? What do they, where's the additional information that they need to set their mind at ease or to find that reassurance around a story? So, whereas I think you get vested interests in all sorts of different areas in the newspaper, the editor is to sort of try and retain some kind of independence from those vested interests to, to come up with the right news balance. And how do you know... Alison, what your readers are interested in. Well, that's why I think that that role has become uh, more important than ever in a way, in that well, now we've taken it away from the idea that um, the, the editor is this sort of great figure in their ivory tower. My role is to stay as connected with the readers as much as I can. So I talk to them, we go out, meet them, we have regular sessions with the readers, I read all their emails, I read their letters, um, I talk to them, and... Uh, I think as well, in this country as well, we have quite defined news brands in the established uh, media that you can very much get to know your readers and you've got to feel that you are challenging them, reflecting them, um, making them feel reassured. It's all those roles. So it's an ongoing relationship. And my role is to make sure that they get the content that makes them feel satisfied. Do you feel, Anson, now, given that you're part of a much bigger group mm. with reach... Has that changed at all in how you work as um, the whole business in terms of your, your relationship with your audiences or, or readers? Um, Does that change at all because you're now part of this bigger organisation? No, I don't think it has. So for me, very much when last year Reach took on um, The Express and The Daily Star, I um, said to the Mirror team, we have got to protect and... Um, promote the Mirror brand more so than we ever have done at any point in its history because there is obviously a risk that we are sharing some copy, um, not in politics or campaigns, but on sort of news of the day and sport. Um, there could be a, a terrible risk that th those brands become blurred and, and there was one big grey mush. And that is the worst possible outcome of this for any of the news brands. So more than ever, I am very, very focused on the Mirror being what the Mirror is and what the Mirror has been throughout our history. Um, and so that doesn't, I'm not worried about that at all, really. Nancy, could I come across to you? Um, obviously, two national newspaper um, editors uh, on my left. Is there a different role? Uh, as I said, when, when I was at the Lennox Herald, I was very aware that Bill Heaney was a member of the community and the paper was a member of the community. And you learned a huge amount about what the role of a good journalist is. And it was always out of the office speaking to people, finding out what was going on, etc. Tell us about being an editor of a powerful and incredibly important city-based newspaper. So I think, maybe just describe it slightly differently, but I see my role as fighting for Sheffield. Very much local newspapers need to fight for their patch. And I don't think you really need to ask us how we know what our readers want, because they stop us in the supermarket and we live, we are, we are our community. Um, I also think I, I see my role as fighting for our journalists because they have got one a, a really, really, really tough job. They're coming from university and they do everything that journalists used to do and about 20 things on top. Um, and it's, there's nothing more discouraging than when people who are former journalists will come in and go, oh, back in the golden era. And it kind of makes me want to strangle them because actually <laughs> we've got some brilliant, I'm sure everybody has got some absolutely brilliant journalists doing a phenomenally difficult job in, in a newsroom that is smaller than anybody ever imagined the newsroom would get to. Um, and so I kind of feel it's a dual role of sort of 
looking after the journalists, letting them make the decisions. Um, it's very rare that I will go, no, we're not doing that. It's got to be this way, because I feel we're all part of that community. So it is about sort of trying to encourage them to come up with their own ideas and sort of reflect what it is in their sort of immediate neighbourhoods. But also really sort of doing what we can to make Sheffield more on the map nationally. And so that, it is, it is quite a powerful role still, but in a rather different way, because I like to think we're kind of working with Sheffield. And it's funny, because I often do talks and kind of go, we're on Sheffield's side, that is the only side we're on. And then the council will go, oh, well, you said that, but then you're giving us a kick, and I'm kind of, that's not the same thing. So I think we, we ultimately always try and follow the line that we will stick up for Sheffield. But in different circumstances, that means incredibly different things. I should mean, Does that mean the people of Sheffield? Is that more, more in a way? Because the council might say, well, they, therefore, you should stick up for Sheffield Council or something, shouldn't you? For the, pe for the people of Sheffield, yeah, but also for the good of Sheffield, I think. Um, so in terms of your campaigning, often they are Sheffield-wide, but sometimes they are just sort of neighbourhood wide and do you know sometimes Sheffield is a really there's a there's really rich areas one of the richest in the country and really really poor areas and sometimes it's trying to have that debate where people might not think you're sticking up for them but actually trying to get that conversation going is really difficult but we are probably the best people to do that and you support people and you give people a kick in as necessary <laughs> <laughs> people are kicking is obviously an important part of it really is well, it, it yeah. is for all newspapers yeah, maybe really I should phrase it slightly different but I'm yeah, from no, Sheffield absolutely. <laughs> absolutely but and and also you make a really interesting point about um journalists now having 20 jobs yeah they've got they've got the report you know when I started in journalism you did your print copy in the evening yeah. for the next day's paper and that was kind of it and if you wrote two stories that was a pretty busy day now you're going to be writing all day every day because you're feeding um, online as well as uh, the newspaper. Yeah. How have you handled that with a smaller newsroom? We've got absolutely brilliant staff and they really rise to the occasion. Um, so when they go out, they're expected to tweet, they'll be taking part in live blogs, they'll be Facebook live and they'll be doing a little bit of video that is properly edited and goes online. Oh yeah, and they're writing their story. Um, so it is... It is, is there time for journalism in all that? We try and make time for journalism, but I think the key is what you said, it's getting them out. Actually, that is the, that's that been the sort of game changer um, in terms of let's not just get distracted worrying about filling the pages. And often that fell back on PR. It's kind of like, no, your job is to go out. Other people can worry about sort of filling the back end pages. And that's that's been a massive thing for us. Um, and actually, quite interestingly, when you sort of change that and go, no, you've got to go out, there's quite a lot of journalists who are a little bit like, what? We've been institutionalised for such a long time. How do yeah. you free us up to go out? But that's what journalism is. Get them out in the community and you get your journalism. Yeah. Vic, tell us a bit about The Voice and being the editor of uh, The Voice, which, again, maybe similar to, to Nancy, is, is very much a paper driven by its readers and the people that you are connected with every day, which may not find a voice in other bits of the media. Yeah, very much so. Um, and first, if I could preface it, my apologies for my coughing interruption. I did, nope. have, a sore, <laughs> I did have a sore throat. I was a bit worried I wasn't actually going to make it today, but you know, it's great to be here with you all. I mean, um, in terms of sort of the role of the editor, just picking up off some of the things that have already been said on the panel, um, I think it is all that good stuff, you know, you're checking copy, you're you know, thinking about headlines, you're thinking about designs and all the rest of it. But I think that, as I said before, the role of an editor is not unlike um, if you follow football, I don't know how many of you do, but it's not unlike um, being like a football manager in the sense that what you are often doing is drawing out um, the voice, you know, of writers that basically developing their storytelling ability their news judgment uh, if you like i think the what the thing about the paper as you you mentioned in in the intro there is that uh, we are often seen as a community paper but with a national focus and so what that actually means in practice is that we have a lot of contributors um, you know who feel that they have that relationship with us will write for us you know will have their particular perspectives won't always be able to translate that you know into copy so very often it's about nurturing it's about coaching um, I think there's another um, aspect you know of the editing role which is really about being able to um, see um, gaps where people don't see them, you know, whether that's in terms of what might make a good story, what might make a good investigation, 
what might make in terms of a good commercial strategy, you know, for a paper. Um, and I think it's two hats. And I think similarly with, with Nancy as well, you've got, um, yeah, I suppose you, you, you know, you have a, as well as an editing role, you, you have to have a campaigning role, you know, in the sense that a lot of the stories that come to us you know, will be about miscarriages of justice, will be about ways in which they're being failed, um, you know, obviously by authorities. So you almost kind of take up that mantle, you know, and campaign and, and choose those stories um, based on that. And Vic, I'll come, the campaigning one I think is interesting about um, uh, how much you have to do original journalism and campaigning journalism to motivate your, your, readership, your readers. Vic, how has your how has that world changed for the voice? Given that, as I said to Chris, um, self-publishing, new um, types of media organisations um, who would who would imagine that their readership is similar to yours, they're on your patch in a way that maybe they weren't 10, 15, 20 years ago. Well, certainly they weren't 10, 15, 20 years ago. How has that changed the way? As an editor, you have to think about what it is the voice is doing. It's definitely made it a lot more complex. Um, as you said, um, self-publishing, you know, I think has sort of changed the game uh, in many respects. Um, and obviously, you're having to compete against blogs, um, against Instagram sites, against Facebook, and you know, and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, I think. One of the challenges, or I think one of the challenges, certainly for a paper uh, like The Voice, is that we have had to almost sort of um, look at, um, for example, obviously new sources of revenue, um, you know, and, and look at kind of how we monetize, um, you know, obviously certain content. But also, I mean, I think bearing in mind, um, the, you know, the issue you just raised, I think one of the also, one of the also really important issues is this sort of whole idea of partnerships. So we've had to be very active in developing partnerships with community organizations who will provide content, will share our content, um, you know, who will, for example, spread the word for us. And, and, and what's interesting is, is that, and it's an interesting one in that many editors have said that they've also um, faced this particular problem, but it, it means that you factor that into um, the editorial judgment and the news meetings that we have um, and certain campaigns that we have um, and they'll provide you content. So I think it, it really is um, uh, certainly made it a lot more complex because like I said, I think when I, I kind of started, um, you know, those were the days when, for example, the ad team would come down and they would say, we've got a great advertorial that's got to, you know, go in uh, at all costs, your nice, feature, you know, your double page spread, just rip it up. And my response was always, okay, we can put it in, put it at the back of the paper where no one can see it. Because, you know, that was the thing as an editor, you would just, you had the contempt for editorial. editorial. Now, I, I think uh, the challenge we face, and I think other editors may allude to this, um, is the challenge you face is, a, is the rise of brand journalism. Um, or content marketing, as it's, it's now uh, called. So what that means is, is that you've got a lot of um, advertisers who are very, very skilled at storytelling and engaging the audience. Um, the, the best kind of examples you, you'll see of it are, you know, the kind of... Um, you know, the, 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 so Cadbury's will do a, a YouTube video that gets thousands of hits and all the rest of it. So we now have to contend with that um, on an editorial front and also on an advertising front. Um, and so what that, in essence, means is that, well, how do you kind of contend with that? Some of our top stories will be, um, you know, advertorials or content marketing. Is it engaging? Absolutely. Um, is it journalism? Not necessarily. So it's certainly made it a lot more complex for us, I think. That's, you've raised some really interesting points there, Vic. Alessandra, can I come to you around how an editor, I must admit, something I'm pretty ignorant about, how does the editor operate in a service like Reuters? Mm. So we're different, obviously, than than uh, than, than everybody else. All, all of you are our clients. Um, so you know, we we serve. Um, we have two sets of, of clients. Um, we well, first of all, we are very big. So we have two thousand three hundred journalists around the world. 
um, including photographers, uh, video journalists. And uh, we have two different clients, essentially, that we serve. We serve a financial client, um, a terminal client, a very sophisticated, with very sophisticated financial news. And we serve um, media clients like all of you. Um, you know, who generally want more sort of general news, political news, economic news, but also business news. So there's a lot of overlap um, between our two broad sets of clients. We also have our, our own sort of internal client, which is our own website, but that's a much, uh, our consumer business is much smaller, which is why a lot of the decisions you have to make are different for us because we don't have a direct uh, interaction with the, with the consumer. It's sort of, the cons it's our client's client, if you will. Um, and so, you know, we publish three million items a year. Uh, so clearly no editor could ever be on top of three million clients a year. And so what I try to do actually is prioritize, you know, for, for we have to cover, we are everywhere, we have domestic language services who write in their own languages in most of the countries we, we operate in around the world, and then we serve an international audience. And so I think what is harder for us often is, you know, to prioritize. Sometimes it's obvious, like in the story, like in Hong Kong, obviously we put a lot of resources, you know, in a story like Hong Kong. You know, Bolivia is, you know, Bolivia or, you know, Brexit uh, or, um, you know, any big sort of emerging story, we put a lot of resources in Myanmar. You know, some things are obvious because they're big stories that are happening. Other times we have to, it's harder for us to decide we're going after this because some Something that is important. We are of no nationality, so something that is important in one country may be less important in another country. So I, I think that that in, in my role, you know, I kind of give the support to what not to do, uh, you know, to what to prioritize, which I think is a great skill in any case in, in, in journalism. But in addition, you know, I mean, I was in newspapers for most of my career, and you know, there is a great discipline knowing that you can write 600 words or no more because there's no more space. Now, obviously, the digital age has, has changed that, but that discipline, in a news agency, we have infinite space, but we don't have people's infinite time to, to read us or to view us, and we certainly don't have infinite resources. So the prioritization helps in the news judgment, but also helps you know, decide where we put what are limited resources, even for us, you know, having such a big, uh, big newsroom, really. But I think you're right in terms of the role that what has changed is we do work in a matrix. So for example, for us, security is very, very important. We have a huge security apparatus. And so, you know, I may decide that we, you know, want to, you know, go really big, you know, into Syria, for example. But if, you know, after, after what, what the recent events, but, you know, if, if, there's, if, if we deem that that's not sure, secure for our journalists, then my journalistic ambitions will come up against, you know, my colleague who's in charge of security who will basically say, you know, no. And so, you know, that, that's one area. Budget is another area, obviously, and, and there are countless other examples. So certainly it's more of a matrix. Yeah. Uh, and how, is, and how has your world been changed? We say, obviously, a lot of your career in newspapers, but for an agency like Reuters, how has your world been changed mm -hmm. by the fact that your clients, us, um, may need different material, are in a much more complicated and competitive environment? Have you had to think about how you service your clients with, with copy and information and journalism that is useful to them in this more complicated world? As you say, you're sort of one removed, but clearly we're all being challenged by the same type of issues. Right. So we think about this all the time. It is our biggest kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of, it's, it's the thing we think about most. And I think what we've come up with, and I think this is true, and you should all tell me whether it is true, is that, <laughs> you know, we are pretty much everywhere, more than everybody else. And so what is most valuable for all of you, and this is true for our financial client as well, is the breaking news, the most important breaking news of the day, of the week, of the year, because we are there. So we are the source of, of information in, in many places. And I, our research uh, you know, shows that that's what our big clients want us for the most. Now, how the clients then use that information will differ. So that, you know, say a newspaper might take an entire story. Um, you know, the BBC might just use us sort of as, oh my God, this is happening in Zimbabwe. We're going in ourselves, but you might not be there in that moment. Yep. Um, but that's okay. You know, I, we see ourselves as the source of, of the source of vital, important information about the world. Then, of course, we've also developed, and this goes to sort of the, the, the more investigative aspect, we have developed a very robust investigative unit, um, which, which we do. Um, I mean, our, our, some of our clients are interested in that, some less, but we do that because we feel that it, that's public service, and so we do it anyway. 
um, because we feel it's very important. Uh, you know, so our Myanmar coverage, our Philippines coverage, um, you know, we do that. I, I hate to say irrespective of our clients because our business model is to serve our clients, but you know, to a certain extent, we would do that anyway, even if nobody directly were interested because we feel that it's important for the world. Chris, Vic raised an interesting issue around campaigns and the changing attitude towards that type of journalism. Now, I've noticed at The Telegraph, I was fortunate enough to work there for many years with you and under Ian. So you were. Um, uh, you have a lot of campaigns now. You have Women Mean Business, you have data journalism, you have lots of things where you will use logos. And is that an approach because in a world of hyper competition, actually making an impact is much harder maybe than for the Telegraph 10 years ago because, or certainly 15 years ago, because the digital world has meant, and we certainly found this at the BBC, that for our audiences, there are you know, literally a hundred other things they could be doing than engaging with us. Yeah. Has the campaign been a method of trying to spark not only initial interest, but then long-term interest with things that you think are important? You're probably right. I mean, I think it's, it is um, challenging to be heard, um, uh, perhaps more challenging. We, I don't know that we have more campaigns um, than we've ever had, but I do hope that they are more noticeable. I think, you know, as a rule of thumb, I try to have about four campaigns on the go at any time, and hopefully they have a clear end, which is usually uh, a change in the law or some other change in society. So, as you say, we are campaigning regarding women mean business and the funding of women entrepreneurs. And last year, on a related theme, we we had a few issues with Sir Philip Green and the use of non-disclosure agreements at work. And, and, and we've got a duty of care campaign all about the, the duty of care that uh, internet platforms owe to, to um, children. But I, so it is important, I think. Um, Are they your decisions, Chris? Are they, right, I, I, you walk in in the morning and say, right, I want to do this. When they, when they go well, they are always my... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, they are the product of conversations. Um, you know, the, the Women Me Business campaign, for example, came from the fact that I think it was a hundred years since women's suffrage. And I said to, we tend to sort of loop um, uh, graduates and senior people together and you put them in little groups and you say, come up with an idea. And we, we tossed around a few ideas, backward looking, forward looking. We agreed something forward looking and we thought, well, what's compatible with the Telegraph sort of free market principle? So we, we came up with that. And the, the Philip Green thing, well, uh, that came up largely because we were, we were looking around and looking at one or two things such as Harvey Weinstein and, and wondering if there were a comparable... Am I about to say something defamatory? Oh, perhaps I am. There anyway, we were, noise yeah, it's, it's all, it's all the time advice. Record, isn't it? <laughs> we, we were looking around and um, anyway, we found ourselves investigating uh, non-disclosure agreements. I think more broadly, however, going back to the role of the editor, I think one of my duties is to convey to all the brilliant journalists we have that there's no point going into journalism and just making up the numbers and topping and tailing copy, as we used to say. Try to do something distinctive. Try to do something uh, that cuts through because it's obviously great for the Telegraph, great for our brand, but it's also great for you. And, it, and it's quite easy to have a career in journalism without ever being associated with, with anything that cuts through. I try to say to people, uh, get yourself associated with something which people will remember. I think I ask you, Chris, another point that Vic made around what some people have described as the commercialization of news. Advertorials, as they may be described, brand journalism, I think was a nice way to put it, Vic, that, that this has, many have argued, has had a rather insidious effect on newspapers particularly, but on news websites, in that commercial operations are now far slicker at presenting information to the public and audiences, sometimes via traditional um, titles, that looks like news. And there is, is there, well, there is a suspicion amongst some readers that that blurring of what used to be church and state <laughs> has, has gone too far. Yeah. Oh, I, I feel very strongly about this. And um, I mean, contrary to what our advertising department might say, I, I like advertisers very, very much because they... They pay us money, which helps to uh, subsidise journalism. But I think 
it is very, very important uh, that the reader knows immediately that this is not a piece of journalism. This, this is a piece of advertising. It can be beautiful, as Vic says. It can be engaging, but it's not journalism. It's a, it's a commercial message, and we have to be clear that there's a difference, um, and that's what I strive to ensure. Nancy, have you found that pressure similar um, in terms of... Maybe pressure's the wrong word, but you won't say it was a pressure, but it's, it's, a more, you, to be, it's more complicated now, navigating... Because you, as an editor, you are responsible, not responsible, but it is important about the revenues, the commercial future of the organisation that you uh, uh, help run. Has that become harder for papers like yours and news organisations like yours? I think it's made us have to approach things in a different way. So not everybody wants to buy a 17 by 9 on page 5 now. So we're kind of looking at different ways of actually how do we, a lot more sort of, partnerships, which isn't necessarily about advertorials, but it's kind of about doing campaigns with more support or doing award events with more support, you know, a lot more sort of thinking differently about... I think there is a lot of people who want to support us, but actually they just don't want an ad in the paper and they don't necessarily want an ad online, so it's thinking around that, which is the real challenge, because they're not 100% sure what they want. So <laughs> we're still trying to find a thing. Is there that... a danger, though, with... Is there a danger, then, of blurring... If you've got a massive sponsor of your biggest campaign or your biggest event of the year, and then controversy blows up around that sponsor in no. your area, doesn't that make put your head in two places? No. I don't think... We're, we're journalists, it just doesn't... <laughs> I think it's, we, we ultimately, I mean, journalists would love to be funded magically. You do need to <laughs> think of the commercial element. But no, if the, we, we just, we, sometimes the journalists sort of question it and say, oh, well, it's a bad thing about this group who we know we work well with. But the, I, I have many, many conversations around kind of like the relationship has got to be bigger than that. We kind of work with you. It's, it's the same thing, I won't use the kicking phrase again, but it, it's just got to work like that. And sort of the big organisations, they understand that, they don't like it. But that is what journalism is at the end of the day. We promote them when they've done something good, and if they haven't, then yeah. we don't. Alison, how, is it, how, how has that relationship changed for an editor? You know, I, I think you know, probably when we started in our career, I, to, to, to Vic's point, you know, the commercial side was seen as sort of nothing to do with us, almost the enemy. This notion that, I remember at The Observer, when I was head of news at The Observer, this notion that they could take an advert on page three yeah. was anathema to any news editor. This was a disgrace and a, and a, and a calumny <laughs> against journalism. Yeah, well, any when, advertiser could, could, could go onto my beautiful page three, which was so important. And, uh, well, when I started out at the uh, Mirror, so 2001, I remember Piers Morgan sporadically would just ban all commercial people from the floor and they just weren't allowed <laughs> up. Um, but, you know, everything's changed and we now have a really, I would say, a very good relationship with our commercial department. Um, obviously, there are things that I don't like at all. We have, sometimes we have strips on the bottom of page one ads. Um, we have other ads that can look pretty shocking when you see them across a page, the way they've been designed. But, I mean, we're a PLC. We need to fund journalism. We're working in a very challenging environment. So... There are compromises that have to be made in that. But I think when it comes to that line between commercial and editorial in terms of um, commercial um, pretending to be editorial, that's the absolute point where you have to say, so far, no further, that is not acceptable. And it's a lot easier to have those conversations if you've got a good relationship with your commercial team. You can say, well, look, you know, I took a strip on page one yesterday and I, and I did that last week, but there's absolutely no way that that's getting in the paper. And that, that, that can happen. And it's a mutual do, you, do, you win, do you win those arguments? Yeah, pretty still? much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, because I think they know that we will, we will be rational and sensible about a lot of things, and it's not just editorial kicking off, that we are very much working together and we do a, we do a lot of work around them and uh, with them. But, but you have to retain your integrity because otherwise your brand has no value, not even a commercial value to advertisers, if you have diminished your brand by, by doing things you shouldn't do. Yeah. And... If Chris, I, yes. if I may add, yes, this is a slight bugbear, I, I, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone. I think we sometimes do ourselves a, a disservice by talking about editorial versus commercial, because after all, we are a commercial department because we make something that people yes. want to buy, and, and they value it, they buy it, precisely because it is journalism, and it's not influenced by something else. So I try to, um, I mean, I use the word editorial versus commercial, but I try to, to point out to... Um, all and sundry, the fact that we journalists 
make things that people buy. Yes, and certainly in print, I mean, obviously digital is a whole, wholly different world, but in print, cover price still produces a, a significant amount of our revenue. That's about your journalism. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and, the, yes. and the advertisers are paying to advertise yes. next to our valuable journalism. Yes. So. Alessandra, can I move us on a bit onto the question of diversity and newsrooms and how we operate as a, as a, um, a sector? Clearly challenging. It'd be interesting to hear uh, Reuters um, approach these issues. I think one of the trends has been over the last uh, few years is this notion of, at some organisations, this the middle classization of news that, in a way, lots of the roots um, into uh, mainstream journalism are now only open or appear to be more limited to graduates. And that means that many diverse voices that maybe we were more used to seeing loud in newsrooms have diminished to an extent. Now, this is obviously not true of all bits of the, of all bits of the sector. And I'm sure, you know, all of us here have different experiences. But what do you think about diversity and diversity of voice? And has this sector done enough to move itself into a fair reflection of the UK? So I can speak more sort of globally because, yeah. of course, we, we yeah. face this globally because, you, you know, we want to have, we need our coverage to reflect the people whom we cover, not just in the UK, but uh, in, you know, throughout Latin America, throughout Asia, throughout India. You know, I was just recently visiting our bureaus in India and rightly a reporter said to me, you know, we don't represent the caste system. Uh, correctly at Reuters, which is something I, I'd never heard, and I thought, well, you know, that's a legitimate that's a legitimate request. Um, so, I mean, what, what what do they mean by that? Just to well, just saying, yeah. we need to have if you want to be tr if you want to cover mm. India yep. well, you need to have you need to represent every mm -hmm. part of society. Whereas traditionally, hand on heart, we we, we had not thought that way. Um, and what, what we do think a lot of is there's a lot of uh, osmosis among our bureaus. So people who, you know, start in China will then, you know, work in Argentina. And, and you know, so we have global representation. But I had never been faced with, with this question. So we're, we're working on it. Um, but one of the ways we do it, um, so th to your answer, do we do enough? I think we don't do enough as a, a as, a, uh, as an industry. Um, and, and clearly it's important. I mean, if you think... You know, I, we covered the uh, migration crisis, uh, well, both from Syria, but also sort of from um, Africa up through Europe a lot, you know, when it became a big European issue, uh, you know, three years ago. One of our main reporters on that was an Ethiopian reporter. We would never have been able to do what we did in covering that if she hadn't been able to go there and speak in, as an equal, uh, you know, in covering that story. So I think it's, it's, it's fundamental, not because it's the right thing, which of course it is, but it's fundamental because it just helps us fulfill our role as journalists better. Um, what we've done, and I mean, I can talk at length, but I'll just mention a couple of things. What we've done is we have a trainee scheme, which I think probably some of the people working in your organizations have come through the Reuters trainee scheme over the years. And in fact, we really struggle to keep it alive because it's so important, but obviously funds always tend to go towards, you know, training, and, and this is very important. And we... Are ex we, we are very careful on our trainee scheme to make it ever more diverse every year that, you do, that we do it, and we do it in different parts of the world, so reflecting the part of the world that, that we're in. And then we've just named at um, a, a global managing editor for talent and diversity um, who is going to focus entirely on, on this issue uh, as part of talent, because of course it's, it's, it's not diversity for diversity's sake, it's talent, and, and it's what we want to be. So those are just a couple of things yep. we've done just, just recently. What do you think, when you look at the, the media um, uh, sector in the UK, diversity, I've, I've, I've been writing about diversity in the media since I was media editor of The Guardian in the 1990s, and, and still it feels that there's a long way to go in terms of, and I'm not talking about a single type of diversity, ethnicity or gender, but just a general view of newsrooms. That Have they become more monocultural? I wouldn't say so. Um, I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I think certainly in terms of the print media, um, I think it seems as though that diversity hasn't really kind of seeped through. Um, what I think 
we are seeing, or when I say we, as in the kind of things I've experienced at, at, at The Voice, I think that broadcasters, that the broadcast side um, you know, of our industry is getting there. And I think that one of the reasons why it's getting there is just simply one of the things you mentioned earlier, which is this um, explosion, if you like, and sort of social media, um, you know, producing content for, for YouTube. So I think one of the things that's, one of the things that I think we've seen, um, you know, is certain broadcasters being very adept at looking at talent out there, you know, videos that are being produced, people who are doing things on Instagram, um, you know, or, or Twitter or whatever, and perhaps co-opting some of that talent. So I think that that's a kind of a positive uh, move. Obviously, I think there are more media companies that, for example, have training schemes, um, you know, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, traineeships, if you like. And, and I think are generally very aware of how di important diversity is because obviously you need to, you know, kind of reflect uh, the audience. I think one of the, the, the big barriers, and again, I think it's one of the challenges that face our industry, which is that um, a lot of interns who will come through, you know, at you know the very first rung of the ladder, um, are often expected to do unpaid unpaid um, internships or you know apprenticeships as, as they as they turned, and um, you know certainly when you're trying to um, widen the pool of talent and you're looking at um, you know, the talent pool in particular communities, there are just some in those communities that just can't afford to do it. Mm. Um, you know, they're not from the backgrounds that can do it. So I think that, you know, that is a particular, a particular problem. Um, and then I think on the other, on the other side of that, um, I think that there's probably some work to do. Just, I mean, this term diversity, I think, gets bandied about. But as you, you said, it's not just about obviously diversity in terms of whether it's gender or ethnicity, but just in terms of thought as well, yeah. different approaches um, you know, to stories, different ways of looking at, at media and doing media and questioning what we do. Um, so I think that there's probably some way um, to go. I think there are some structural reasons as to why um, that is, but there's some interesting reasons as to why I think that that, that diversity is perhaps improving. You know, and, and they're positive reasons as well. Okay, but so before let's come to the audience, final question to each of the panelists from me. Greatest success as an editor and biggest regret. <laughs> wow. Alison. Oh, oh, um, oh dear. Uh, well, I've only been you can blow your trumpet here no, no, no. and also okay. blow a raspberry. Okay, well, I've only been doing this job uh, for just over a year, so can I get that one yeah. in first? Okay. Um, I think the successes have been where we have worked across uh, the entire mirror, so that, I mean, digital, print, sports, news, features, the whole lot. Um, on, a, on a few of the special, like we did, we did a thing earlier in the year where we created a special edition by young people, which was sort of quite innovative and we'd never done anything like that before. And then we did something similar on homelessness. But what I particularly liked about that was when we had some of the digital sports guys out there reporting for, for that edition. It, it, it's a real sort of sense of family at, at, at the mirror. And I think that's great when we all work together. So I was very pleased about being able to kind of try and help make those things happen. Um, I think there's been a few sort of things, well, there's quite a lot of things that I wish I'd done better and I'm sort of constantly, I've got a list actually of my failures <laughs> which I carry around with me. <laughs> Only one, you I need think, to share one. <laughs> but I think the one thing that I feel um, I need to do more of and generally we need to do more of, we've got to start making a better case around why the established media in this country matters, particularly to advertisers. Um, I don't want to upset any of your sponsors, but you know, you've got Facebook and Google here that are probably paying for the canapes. But actually, what are they doing? They are taking our content and they are taking our advertisers and we have got to start fighting a bit hard against that one. Nancy. So mine kind of loops back to the diversity question. I worked on local newspapers right across the country and until the last year, I've only ever worked with two people who weren't white. Um, I'm also the first woman to have ever edited a newspaper in Sheffield, which I think is great, but it's also embarrassing for the city and for the newspaper industry. But actually, so we now have um, 
through the, fa through the Facebook Community News Scheme, and um, we've got a Roma Sovak um, woman who is absolutely brilliant. And it's really interesting because they are, in Sheffield particularly, they are the most vilified community, and she's really struggling to build trust, which says an awful lot about us as established media. Um, and, and actually, we'd, we knew what we wanted. We think that, it, that sort of black and ethnic minorities are really, really up, underrepresented in journalism, and particularly sort of people from working class background, put those the two things together, advertise a job without saying that so bluntly, and actually we didn't have many applicants who you were, you know, you had this ideal, and actually I'm, I fear that we're not even... There's a trust issue there, isn't there? There is, yeah. and I'm fear we don't even get them, particularly as readers, let alone applying for jobs, and that is a massive, massive piece of work. So I'm, I'm less pos positive than Vic, I'm not yeah. sure we have We've got a success it. there, so let's, let's got, take the success. We've got some really good successes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I feel the way, the way we sort of address race and racism, I've been really, really proud of how we've done that, not just the people in, in the office, but sort of how the paper does it. Do you know, in terms of regret, man's a bit of a jokey one, but when I look back through the archive and the editors used to have chauffeurs and people opened yeah. the doors and said, tell me you'd get measured for your suits. My regret is I didn't do this job in the 1920s. Yeah. That would have been good. Wasn't that that good? would have been good. Yeah. Chris, um, greatest success. Well, I think the greatest success that... Um, we've enjoyed during my time was about a year ago when we agreed as a company to pursue a subscriptions strategy because like all of us we'd been worrying uh, about the future and this was something that I strongly believed could secure the future of Telegraph journalism and, and which also restored the primacy of journalism to the Telegraph so uh, I'm very proud of it and uh, Touch wood, glass. It seems to be going quite well so far. My, my, um, like Alison, I think we should, we, I have a, I have this kind of negative CV of all the things I've got wrong, yep. um, and I will never share them with anyone. <laughs> but it's always worth bearing. It's like memento mori. It's worth bearing in the back of mind. I think, I think the regrets are always about loss of nerve. I mean, we probably all know that experience when you're standing there at conference or whatever, standing in my position. You say, "Should we do this?" And people will look at the ground as if you're an idiot, yes. and, you, and you don't do it. And then the next day, somebody else has done it, and it's brilliant. And you think, why didn't I do it? So that's usually mm. what I regret. Nearly always. Mm. Alessandra. So I've also been in this job five months. So, oh, OK. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, however, I, think I think maybe that, your career more generally, yeah, I think, yeah, is the question. No, but yeah. I, think one of, I think, you know, one of our, uh, what I would say was one of our biggest successes at Reuters, recent successes at Reuters, was, um, uh, was the uh, amazing coverage that um, our ma amazing Myanmar coverage on the on the uh, Rohingyas that got our two reporters Walon and Chaso in jail um, but then we were able to get them out um, that was 511 days that we we when they were in jail that we not only tried you know did everything that we could in our power to get them out and then they eventually got the presidential pardon but also and this is you know, kind of the true spirit of Reuters, although I'm tooting our horn a little bit, but then, you know, kind of fearlessly publishing what they had worked on at the same time. And so I think we're all very proud, proud of that, and I'm part of that. Um, I think biggest regret, uh, you know, uh, well, my personal biggest regret is so many days I want to be out there still reporting. Uh, you know, I still love the very kind of, you know, shoe leather heart of our, of our profession. Um, uh, but I think that, that you really, that what you said is true, is that I think we need to, the, the sort of traditional mainstream media. I almost hate to say that, because yes. what does it mean? Yes, but I think we kind of know what it means. You know, we need to be stronger at defending what we do and what we do well. And it's interesting, I was reading a, a, a recent um, report uh, from the United States about the importance of corrections in, yeah. in the news media and how important correcting our mistakes are, because of course we only really write the first draft of history and um, we need to be very honest about correcting our mistakes and that that can really uh, add to trust in the media, which of course is, is low. So I think, I guess the big sort of cosmic regret is, should we do more? But at the same time, we don't want to be seen as lobbying for our industry, but we kind of have to. So- I don't think anybody else is going to look after us. So it is down to us, yeah. Thank you, Alessandra. Vic, finish off with this, and I think you've touched on some interesting points, which maybe will come up in the questions around trust and the media's role and the trust relationship that has changed with the readers. But Vic, what, what's your sense of your greatest success in your your biggest regret? Oh, greatest success. If I could be allowed, so there were two things that I think I've been sort of very proud of. So um, this year, 
we did a front page article on a lady called Philippo Kujima, who is the chair of UK Black Pride, um, which is um, uh, an African Caribbean LGBT organization. So I think she'd been um, appointed uh, you know, to a, a new position as the head of a charity. I brought it to the news meeting and I said, well, look, you know, she's the first of her kind to do this job. I think we should put it on the front page. Um, you know, the team backed me. The, the significance of that, the context of that is, is that um, The Voice had for many years been seen as an anti-LGBT paper. I think that goes back to something that happened in 1991, I think it was, which was um, we basically, uh, before my time at the paper, but we basically published um, what can now be seen as quite a, yeah, a defamatory, um, certainly not a positive article on Justin Fashionu, who is the brother of John Fashionu. Um, and um, it, without going on to, into the, the, the details of the story, but what it did is that it, I think it played into a lot of the kind of, um, I want to say prejudices, um, there's, a very, uh, there's a very strong anti-LGBT um, strain in the African Caribbean community. A lot of that is faith-based maybe, um, you know, for whatever reason. So that had been going on, I think, certainly um, for, yeah, for many, many years. I said, well, look, you know, let's put it on the front. Um, obviously, people were kind of scared about that. Um, I said, well, look, let's just do it anyway. Surprisingly, the team backed me. We put it out there. And I have to say, um, you know, the response to it was humbling. Um, you know, just on social media. I mean, I think certainly, you know, um, uh, you know, when you don't get things right, you know, as a publication, as a, as a media organization, um, you know, social media can really, um, yeah, can, can give you a good beating. Um, but I think on this, on this occasion, I think it was just the, the, the feeling of, of warmth. And I think, you know, there was this sense that, you know, we had welcomed back a section um, of our community. So that was great. Um, the Windrush special, um, the Windrush 70 um, um, that we did last year was a great moment for me because um, what that actually involved was just um, curating and collating um, stories about hope, you know, people's hope coming to the UK in the 1950s, overcoming discrimination, um, setting up families, trying to get work. Um, a lot of those kind of individual stories, I think, really weren't, um, you know, in mainstream media before. So it was, and I'm always a big fan of history and history stories, so that was fantastic. Um, failures, I have none. Um, <laughs> no, sorry, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, no, I think... I think you think just said it like that. No, I, I should, I should, yeah, I should, I should have done it. I should have done it. Um, I, think, I think my biggest regret is, um, so back in 2000, we ran a campaign about two um, African and Caribbean men who were found hanging. They basically, they'd been murdered. They were hanged within six months of each other. Um, and um, we got on that story. Um, initially, I think it had uh, come to us from the actual family of one of the men in, in Telford. They had no... no um, luck in terms of obviously raising the story. We took it on. Um, you know, it did eventually become a national story. It was a big talking point uh, for several months. And, and I wanted to keep on at it and keep rushing it. Um, but I think that I didn't. And one of the reasons for that is that it, it really plays into one of the things we were talking about earlier, which is that relationship between um, the commercial side and the um, journalism side. So basically what happened is, you know, we were told from the higher-ups that we had to cease because it was, uh, it was um, upsetting um, the local council, you know, in, in the area. Um, it wasn't good, you know, for advertising revenue. Um, try as hard as I did, I... Yeah, I, I just didn't win the argument. argument. And it was a really important campaign. And I think looking back, um, I just wished I'd pushed a bit harder. You know what I mean? Um, I understand the reason for it. Um, but I, yeah, that, that was a particular regret, I think. Thanks for that. That was a really honest, um, really honest uh, story and shows that tension that mm. we all battle with.
uh, with commercial versus uh, other parts of the business. Let's have some questions, wonderful audience. Put up your hands, Adam Cannon. I'll do the gentleman next to Adam, and then I'll come to Adam. <laughs> there's, a, there's a microphone coming to you, yeah. Can you just say your name and which organisation you. you work for, or, or what you do in, in life? Uh, Andy Sibsey, I'm the editor of the Jersey Evening Post. We, we've all got used to operating in a challenging landscape, doing more with fewer resources, and the axe has variously fallen on sub-editors, photographers. My newsroom is half the size it was five years ago. Um, two questions. Firstly, what do people on the panel wish they'd fought harder for? Um, what? what do people on the panel wish they'd fought harder for? Uh, the battle they perhaps gave up and shouldn't have won in terms of sub-editors and so on. And the other question is, um, what's the most positive insight or learning point they've gathered from that landscape? Yeah. Okay. Nancy, do you want to kick us off? What, what should you have fought harder for? You talk about a newsroom that is now more complicated. Your journalists have much more many more things to do. Is there a battle you lost in terms of that resourcing that you wish you hadn't, and what did you learn from it? I feel I'm maybe about to be ejected, but I almost feel we fought too long against templates and against sub-editing, and we had the real journalism is the content, and all we've got is the content. And actually, I, I think if we've got photographs and good stories, we can live with... I've never had a complaint that that page wasn't beautifully designed or that sort of... That debate happens a lot in newsrooms. It doesn't happen in the real world. Um, so I would love to have sub-editors. I haven't got sub-editors. Um, but I would more love that we'd protected the number of reporters. I think that's the absolute, that is the only thing we've got, really. So it's that notion of, of, of hanging on to something because you've always done it like that without really realising that readers don't actually notice or care, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I just think we have debates in the news that aren't real life. Sometimes. Circle of trust in the Society of Editors. And I would have rather we had everything, yeah. but we haven't. We've got to be realistic with what we've got. Yeah. Well, let's say journalists, journalists, newsroom are not exactly, they don't exactly embrace change. I think journalists are not the most... No, we're an oddly conservative bunch, aren't we? Mm. Exactly, yeah. 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 What, Alessandra, what for you? Very interesting question. What, what should you have fought harder for and what did you learn from not winning that fight? <laughs> Well, again, for me personally, I don't, I don't have personal examples, but I think over the, um, over the past few years, we have, um, I'll give a couple examples of what we've tried to do more of in our bureaus, is to have reporters who were traditionally sort of text reporters, you know, reporters who wrote, to, to sort of take out their iPhones, and if you found yourself in front of a situation, yep. also take a picture or take a video, which seems obvious now, but, but actually... You know, for, for somebody, especially in our bureaus, who was doing something very specialized uh, in the financial sector, and they might not have thought about it. So we really pushed, the, have been pushing this over the past four or three years, something that, again, for, say, a millennial seems like a normal thing. You know, millennials now, you know, when they come in, they don't do one medium. They do all, all of them. Um, you know, it, it took a while, I have to say. You know, we're getting better at it. Are we perfect? No. Um, another area where I think we, we kind of were reticent was we... Um, use user-generated content in a, in a lot of in a lot of areas. So Hong Kong is a perfect example, and I think we were all scared of it because, like, well, this is not ours, right? We didn't shoot this video, so it's not ours. But actually, we've created a team uh, who every day they check it. They they check it. They try to call, they call the person who you know. Often, if it's on Twitter, you'll know exactly who who um, took the video, so they fact check it just like we did everything else. And it's a very important part of our coverage now in certain situations where we can't be everywhere. So for example, uh, yesterday's shooting uh, in Hong Kong. Um, so I think those are just some areas where, you know, I think the newsroom kind of bristles, oh, we've never done this before. And you kind of have to uh, push while maintaining your principles that you've always operated. Yeah with all the time. There are some sound principles about trust and integrity and freedom from bias that have to remain, but that doesn't mean you can't push the envelope in the types of media or in the formats you experiment with. Chris, maybe thinking beyond not just being the editor, but obviously you've had very senior roles for many years, is there something that, to Nancy's sort of templating point, I remember these type of arguments, you know, when I was in the print media that you couldn't move on this and you couldn't move on that. I mean, what, what is that thing that you you maybe you should have fought harder for and actually kept hold of? Well, I, obviously, we all understand what you're talking about because many of us, many of you are doing 
twice as much as uh, half the resource, uh, with half the resource. And um, I think the thing, I mean, I'm still fighting this fight, but I sort of regret not starting it sooner and, and um, more forcibly, is that there was a sort of, um, should we say, a, a corporate definition of what a journalist was, which was more or less someone who knew how to publish to lots of different platforms and basically knew how to operate the machinery. And any journalist knows that's not a journalist. You know, a journalist is somebody with something to say, who has something to say, either finds out something that other, somebody else doesn't know and gives it to the public, or, or has a slant on a story. And um, I say this a lot now, but I regret not saying it sooner. In, in, the, in the face of that um, tsunami of different opportunities, and there are different opportunities to publish, and we should embrace those opportunities to publish, but we should never lose sight of what journalism is. Journalism is having something interesting to say. If you stick by the maxim, do interesting stuff, you won't go far wrong. Another question. Lady here. Yep. There's a mic coming to you. Lady just here. She's just down here. Sorry. Yep, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Hi, uh, Tracy DeGroose from Newsworks, and I am one of the people lobbying for this industry and trying to get advertisers to appreciate the value of what we do. If you could go back in time to when the platforms first emerged, what would you do differently and would you still give them access to your content knowing what you know now? Alison, no, presumably. <laughs> um, I think you would give them content, you would, but the ground rules would be laid out much more clearly from the very beginning. I mean, who goes around giving their stuff away for free when, when, you, when we are paying out to get that content in the first place? I mean, my, my answer to that other the question that you, you just asked was about um, what have we lost at the Mirror? We, yes, we have lost uh, reporters over the years. Um, I, I will do everything I can to protect reporters who are breaking stories because we live or die on breaking stories. If we don't break anything, if we don't get talked about, we will disappear into the ether, never to be seen again. But to do that, we need people to pay us for the content that they are then making money from. So it's, we obviously need the, we need the platforms to help distribute our content, but we need them to pay a fair, way, fair pay towards it. It's only right. Chris, do you agree with that? Up to a point. I mean, I, I don't, I mean the problem was that none of us knew how big they were going to be. Um, and I, I think there have been, I mean... I don't disagree with what Alison's saying, but there have been attempts to withhold, in other countries to yeah. withhold journalism from the platforms, and they just go, who cares? Um, I think, I think um, if we could have foreseen what an impact um, they were going to make, I think we could, have, we could have prepared sooner and said, well, let's not lose confidence in what we do, in, in the importance of journalism and, and what we have. Let, let's, let's remind ourselves what we have to give you know, because there are things that we're not. We're not. We're not everything on the internet. We are. We are purveyors of journalism. Interesting, important stuff. And let's 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 knowing, being able to see into the future. Let's think what exactly it is we have to offer. Have they been um, a help to you or a hindrance? Platforms and sharing content. Um, I'd probably say it's been a great help, um, and I think one of the reasons uh, I think. I say that um, in that when you look, for example, at a publication like ours, uh, we've certainly struggled in terms of, you know, obviously advertising revenue, um, trying to, um, if you like, get advertisers to see the value, you know, of what we do. And I think certainly I would have said probably about ooh, ooh, five, six years ago, that was a constant um, debate amongst the kind of the advertising team. But what I think, where I think it's been a, uh, where I think it's been a kind of a great, a great help in the sense that um, the the audience reach of the brand through things like, for example, Facebook, uh, our Facebook platform, and Instagram and Twitter's just been enormous. And I think that what that has helped us to do is to engage a much wider audience than our core audience, you know, in terms of, you know, what we are about and what our values are about. Because even though it's a paper that's rooted in the black community, there is this perception that if you are not black, you can't read it. And that's never 
ever been the case with the paper. Um, I think that what it's kind of helped us to do is to um, share content with a much wider reach, you know, uh, uh, of people. And I think with that um, then comes um, different ways of thinking about um, advertising and content. Okay. Now, we're slightly over time, but I just want to take three or four points from the audience. So um, there's a gentleman there, there's a lady in the middle of the road there, and a gentleman in a blue shirt there. It's Hello, Phil points. Harding, yeah, we're just journalist. Time, but yeah. Hello, uh, Phil Harding, journalist. Um, since nobody has mentioned the B word, I will. Brexit. What difference has it made to your job, and has it made it easier or harder? Great. Thank you, Phil. Lady in the middle there, uh, at the back, and then a gentleman in the blue shirt there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rebecca Vincent from Reporters Without Borders. Um, actually, a question from a press pre freedom perspective, if I may. Alessandra, you noted um, as a, a success, actually, Reuters reporting from Myanmar that had led to the imprisonment of your colleagues, Walon and Kiao So U. Um, what really struck us was actually the, the consistent reporting by Reuters on their plight, but also the campaigning that was then done on their behalf. I wonder if you could talk a bit about the decision-making process that led to it and what you might say to others now considering taking bolder action in similar cases. Okay, thank you. And a gentleman just here in the, in the blue shirt and tie. Paul Conyu, media commentator. Question for Alison in particular. Um, you spoke about protecting the Mirror brand and obviously the, co the, the commercial imperative of bringing together the Mirror and Express titles makes absolute sense. But have you had any reader, if you like, uh, attacks or criticism, uh, you know, of how you, how you manage two such contrasting titles, uh, groups, particularly on Brexit, politics, and the time of a general election? Or are they indifferent to that or unaware of it? Great. Thank you very much. Alison, why don't you tackle that? I'll do the questions in reverse order, given that two of them were to specific. Mm -hmm. so, Alison, let's take on that first one. I'm trying to think, but I cannot think of a single letter that I've had or email or phone call from a reader complaining about our involvement with the Express. We, um, before, when, the, when we took the Express, we sat down, I sat down, in fact, and wrote some protocols, um, which uh, we all, all the editors live by, which is exactly which copy can be shared, which copy can't be shared. Um, if one title has um, created an exclusive, where it can appear in different titles. So if the Mirror has got a great exclusive story, we might not use it on page one, but the Express and the Star wouldn't be able to use it on page one. Um, and we don't share any politics, we don't share any campaigns, and we don't share quite a few exclusives. So we've got some, some quite rigid rules, and I can assure you I go around with a big stick enforcing them if people don't want to from the Express and the Star. Um, and... So the, story, the, the content that we are sharing tends to be sport reports and it tends to be news of the day. Now, the harsh reality is an express reader is an express reader and a mirror reader is a mirror reader and they are very, very unlikely to ever switch on that particular day. So I think largely they're unaware of it and on non-contentious issues like a, a court case in Rotherham or whatever, um, I, I, there really doesn't seem to be much logical reason why we couldn't be sharing that content if it enables us to use the resource that we have got on very brand specific stories and on campaigns and exclusives. It means that we can focus what resource we have got onto the things that define the mirror. And in terms of the readers, I, I honestly haven't had anybody come and complain. Alison, thank you. Alessandra, what, what have you learned and what, are the, what could the rest of the media sector learn from the remarkable work you did? Um, you know. yeah. So I think there are various aspects. First of all, in, in, in getting them out of jail after 511 days, you can imagine there was a huge legal uh, case that we brought forward and our general counsel spent you know, much of her time uh, in Myanmar arguing the case. We also, uh, we campaigned uh, sort of internationally so that many other countries sort of joined us in the campaign internationally. But ultimately, and I think this is what is sort of the important lesson for, for journalism, is that our reporting was based on fact. It was you know, forged in the crucible of truth. And so we had documentary evidence of what we then published. So the two reporters were reporting, then they were put in jail, and then while they were in jail, we published the articles based on their reporting. And we, what, we, what we documented, which was the abuses and the murder of uh, Rohingya minority, 
there was no doubt that what we were writing about was true. We had, and what we were showing in pictures. And I think that that's one of the reasons that our reporters from jail were saying to us, no, you have to continue. You have to publish this even though we're in jail. You have to continue. Because you know, we were in, in contact with them because it was important. They were, they're from Myanmar. Um, they, and they felt that it was very important. And I think, the, so the lesson is that you have to persevere and you also have to stay when others leave because of course we weren't the only ones, you know, over the years we aren't the only ones to have covered the, the, uh, the abuses against Rohingya, but we stayed. Um, and I think th that's sort of the, the lesson journalistically. Um, and then we were very grateful when, when they came out, obviously after 511 days. <laughs> Thanks, Alessandra. Brexit. By the way, can what I say level? Brexit? Some yes. people in this country think it's hard to explain Brexit. Can you imagine explaining it to the global audience? <laughs> I don't have to say on Brexit. Let's see, how much has it changed your job? I think was the question Phil posed. I don't think it has. In all honesty, we hardly write about Brexit. People on a local level and the things that impact on their lives day to day, it's just not one of them. There's, we've got the worst funded schools in the country. We've got hospitals on their knees. We've got a massive homeless problem. I could go on and on and on, and Brexit is not top of their list for things they contact us about or we write about. We do obviously try and keep them abreast of information, but we, most editions don't really mention it. A good antidote. I'll start reading the Sheffield Star more. There you go. More <laughs> day by day. <laughs> 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 That's what you should do anyway. Uh, Mick. Brexit's actually been very good. Yeah, Brexit's actually been very, very good. I mean, I mean, like your readers, you know, I mean, there are some really pressing, pressing issues um, around education, around healthcare, uh, around mental health in particular. But I think certainly there's a section in, you know, in our readership and campaigns, um, Simon Woolley of Operation Black Vote, Lord Woolley as he is now, um, has been campaigning for years basically just to get people to register to vote, you know, in the African Caribbean community. And I think what happens is every general election that comes around, um, there is almost a sort of a, a disassociation uh, from politics, um, a real disconnect with MPs, a feeling that you only ever see them when, you know, an election has come. But, I mean, I think one of the things that we've certainly done um, with this particular, um, in the run-up to this particular general election is, um, so we've tweeted a lot, um, we've done a lot of stuff on Facebook, um, you know, we've done reader polls, we've done kind of vox bops, and, uh, you know, the response has been enormous. I mean, I think we, we covered, we carried a story, I think, only, which only went up on Sunday, um, you know, about um, Abdul Toure, who's um, one of the few black um, members of the Brexit party standing against David Lammy in Tottenham. Um, basically put that on Sunday. I mean, I think it's, it's had a, a re I mean, it's a, it's a huge response, but a, a, a lot of people have commented, you know, on Facebook, have talked about it, um, but I think, for me, I think one of the great things about um, Brexit and, and hopefully the approach that we're taking um, to it is engagement, you know, because that's what we're always saying, engage in the process, um, because so many of our readers are disengaged from the political process. Can I ask a question? To, yeah. did, did, was there, I don't know the answer to this for UK papers, was, was there a Brexit bump in the same way that some of the US newspapers have, have, have gotten a, um, a Trump bump? Alison? Not enormously, but it's not bad for business either. So I, I can't say it's been, it's been good, but I think because particularly in print, the people that are coming to print every day and, and they're willing to pay 80 pence to, for, for a mirror, they're, they're interested in news. So, and, and I think it has been like one long unfolding soap opera with its twists and turns. So I, I think it has, it has kept that engagement. And for, for us, it's been a tricky one, um, perhaps trickier than for Chris, because our readers were pretty much split, marginally to remain, but only very marginally. And so we've had to sort of kind of try and keep a fairly even bat. And we've, so we focus very much on explaining the twists and turns rather than lecturing people on what they should be thinking. That's interesting. Chris, final answer. Brexit, Brexit good or bad been, for the... Brexit has been on. brilliant for our business. And um, <laughs> uh, if you're launching a, a subscription strategy as we were, then you couldn't have hoped for anything better than Brexit because the vast majority of our readers are passionately pro-Brexit and they want to read our news, our comment, and um, our podcasts, listen to our podcasts. And it's, frankly, one of the main reasons why this time next year we should have half a million subscribers. So... Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Brexit. 
Thank you so much to this great panel. Thank you, audience. Sorry to have kept you a little bit longer away from your coffee. Coffee will now be served in the court, I think it's called, towards the back left. There'll be coffee there, and we're all back in here at 11.30. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>